Welcome to Basic Christian Life. The teaching series within this podcast is a part of the Basic Discipleship Program. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Our hope is that this material will equip you with basic Bible truths that you can know how to effectively follow Christ. Now, let's join today's lesson. Hey, welcome to our podcast today. And we are talking about the basic Christian life. We're giving basic, simple Bible doctrine to help us practically live out the Christian life. And we're on lesson number three, and our subject today is prayer. I've often heard prayer likened to spiritual breathing, spiritual breathing. Uh, Prayer is the way that we uh, receive uh, spiritual nourishment and encouragement from the Lord. It's one of the ways, one of the primary ways we receive spiritual nourishment and encouragement from the Lord. As an analogy, it's not really in Scripture, but if that analogy is true, if it holds true, I would say many Christians are gasping for their spiritual breath. Uh, they, They don't have the spiritual oxygen they need, if you will, to really live the Christian life in an abundant and vibrant fashion. Prayer could be defined as communication with God that brings real life, vitality, and freshness to one's spiritual journey. Unfortunately, many believers are slack in this area. You could say that prayer is an aspired value, but it's not an actualized value. It's an aspired value that is something that they desire, something they know they ought to have, but it's not an actualized value. It's just plain and simple. It's not present in their life. So many know they ought to pray, but they fail to do so. Why is this? Well, sure, there are often heart matters associated with prayerlessness, but I believe uh, the trap we find is many times in the area of practical areas. Many stumble, many become ensnared, many become prayerless because they don't have a good practical game plan for implementing prayer into their daily life. So I want to give you in this lesson four action steps you can take in order to make prayer an actualized value in your life. Number one, I would say this, know what prayer is. Know what prayer is. Throughout scripture, we read about this thing called prayer and the Bible over and over again uses this simple Greek word for prayer in the New Testament. You see it in Colossians chapter four, verse two, where we read, devote yourselves to prayer. It's interesting, the Greek word there translated prayer is one that was used in the ancient world and even other religions to speak of the act of approaching, approaching a deity. And we're reminded of what prayer is in its most basic form. It is an act of approaching God drawing near to God. I would give you this basic definition. Prayer is simply talking to God. Prayer is talking to God. Now, that definition may not seem real complex. It's not real sophisticated, but I, but I think it's a, a great definition. I think it's very helpful. See, this is why many people stumble in prayer. They think of prayer being this lofty thing for the spiritually elite They envision it as being something that's too holy for them to engage in. But if you get back to the basic meaning of this Bible word prayer, you see that it's just this act of drawing near to God, approaching him, talking to him. And so I would encourage you, if you want to have a strong prayer life, realize it's just talking to God. You you can get down on your knees and talk to God. When you're preparing your breakfast in the morning, you can talk to God. When you're in the midst of that difficult situation, you can talk to God. This definition reminds us that at its heart, prayer isn't about religion, ritual, some requirement. Prayer is about a relationship. Prayer is talking to God. What else do we need to know about prayer? 
Well, four action steps. Number one, know what prayer is. Number two, I would say this, find a place. Find a place. I think of the story of Daniel, the life of Daniel and his example. In Daniel chapter 6, we have that, that great story about Daniel in the lion's den. Do you remember what sent him to the lion's den? Some of his co-workers had created a scheme to uh, get him in trouble with the authorities. They had asked um, the, the king to pass legislation that would make it illegal to pray to anyone but the king. Back then, uh, in Daniel's day, it was commonly believed that the, the idea of the divine right of kings was commonly believed. It was even taken to the next level where uh, the king was viewed as God. So this law is passed. And what's interesting is that Daniel's co-workers knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that their scheme to get him in trouble would work because they knew he prayed regularly. They actually knew where he prayed. And so they knew that their, their, their scheme was airtight. It would work. Daniel would break the law and get in trouble and they would get rid of him. So in Daniel 6.10, we read that when Daniel learned that the document or this new law had been signed, he went to his house, the windows in his upstairs room opened towards Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Now, now notice Daniel goes to his house to pray, and, and at the end it says, just as he had done before, and we believe the, the, the Bible there is telling us his, his friends, the, the, this was his custom of life, his habit of life, his friends knew when he prayed and where he prayed, it was obvious he took these prayer breaks throughout the day. But notice he's at his house. His windows in the upstairs room are open towards Jerusalem. Now, this would have been on the roof of the house. And in the ancient Near East, homes were often built with this patio on top of the house. Um, it was a place where one, before air conditioning, one could uh, catch a breeze it was more comfortable, more relaxing. It was removed from the daily duties of the house downstairs. And so uh, Daniel finds this comfortable place that's set apart for a sacred purpose where he won't receive distractions from those in the lower part of the house. So we're reminded that in order to have a strong prayer life, it's so important to find a place where we're comfortable praying where we're not distracted in praying. And look, the windows in his upstairs room were open towards Jerusalem based on what we read in 2 Kings chapter 8 when the people of God lived in exile, they were to pray towards Jerusalem. So here's another thing about Daniel's place. It's a place where he can place, for lack of a better word, adequate focus on the Lord. He can gaze towards Jerusalem, the place where the temple was, the place where where the presence of the Lord dwelt upon earth. And so this is a place where he's comfortable, free from distractions, and where he can fully focus on the Lord. Now, a few years ago, the, the movie War Room popularized this idea of having a place to pray. Now, I want you to see it's so important. If you, if you want to have a strong, thriving prayer life that brings spiritual energy and strength into your life, You've got to know what prayer is, but then you've got to find a place where you can focus on the Lord and be free from distractions. Number three, I'd say this, find a time. Know what prayer is, find a place, and find a time. Many people never pray because they don't make it a priority on their calendars. The reality is this, you make time for what's important. Is prayer important to you? Then make time for it. Carve out 30 minutes in your morning for prayer. You say, well, I'm not a morning person. Well, carve out three or five minutes in the morning and then carve out around lunchtime. Take 10 minutes of your lunch break and reserve it for prayer. Have 15 minutes in the evening for your family to gather around and have family prayer. And get away for five minutes minutes in the evening and spend time with the Lord in prayer before you go to bed. Carve out little prayer breaks or prayer retreats throughout your day. 
Make time for the Lord. Don't allow anything to compete with that time. Now, don't be legalistic. Um, Don't think that just by checking a box off the list or or marking something off your calendar, you've done your duty. No, view these times as opportunities for you to get in touch with the Lord and spend time with Him. Make it relational. Make it real. But find time. We see precedent for this in the life of Jesus. When he was busy ministering, Mark 135 tells us that he got up a great while before it was day, while it was still dark, and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Now notice Jesus. Why, why does Mark tell us that he got up a great while before day? I, be, I believe Mark is showing us the importance of timeliness priority, and schedule in praying. Do it. Put prayer on your calendar and don't allow exercising, food, other relationships, other responsibilities to compete with that. Sure, there'll be times you have to make exceptions, but just make it a part of your daily life. Find a time. Know what prayer is. Find a place. Find a time. Lastly, I would say create an agenda. Create an agenda. Sometimes I'll I'll come home after work and I'll tell my wife, hey, this evening I got a couple things I want to talk to you about. And then we'll find a time to sit down and to talk. I found that conversation many times is so uh, beneficial when we've thought ahead of time about what we want to talk about. The same can be said for a prayer life. If you go to your prayer time with an empty head, a blank slate, no plan in your mind, you're likely to have an aimless, wandering prayer life and you're likely to become frustrated at some point and to feel like, wow, this just isn't working. I don't know what to say. You'll likely quit quickly and make your prayer short. So I would encourage you, create an agenda. And here's three helps I would give you. Uh, Number one, use a prayer outline. I've got a a prayer outline here in the back of my Bible. I've got another one I keep in a notebook. Sometimes when it comes time to prayer, I keep a stash of three by five index cards. And I might write down ten things on that list I want to pray for that day before I go into prayer. I might write the names of a few people. I might write the name of a sick person or a missionary. I might write down a few needs I have, a few things going on in society and in the world. I might write down a passage of scripture I want to pray over. I create a prayer outline. Some may think that seems like really, you know, kind of wooden and and formal and I don't know if I like that. Well, I would encourage you to consider the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now Jesus there gives us, if you understand his meaning there, he gives us a prayer outline. He gives us a pattern for praying. He gives us broad categories for which we ought to regularly pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the idea of praise. Give us this day our daily bread. Or your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. That's the idea of supplication. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's the idea of confession and asking for help with forgiveness of of others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's praying over your your struggles and your sins. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's, That's more praise. See what Jesus is encouraging us to do? He's encouraging us to use an outline. And I'll speak from personal experience. My prayer life is so much more robust when I go into my prayer time with an agenda, with a plan, and with an outline. Use a prayer outline. Number letter B. Create a prayer list. So this is similar uh, to what I just said, but but it's a little bit different. 
I would say each time you go to pray, have an outline for praying, but then keep a large, a bigger prayer list. Uh, store this. I, I have it here in the back of my Bible, but but have kind of think of it like a prayer bank where you just have all types of requests, all different types of possible things you could pray for. I've probably got nearly a hundred things written, names and requests and passages of scripture and pastors and uh, people in my family all listed in the back of my Bible. That's a prayer list. And so I have that available when it's time to go pray. And then I can take a three by five card or a notebook and write my prayer outline from that prayer list. Use a prayer list. I think we see precedent for this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. There Paul said, I I urge that first of all, prayers and petitions, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority. He's basically listing out the different types of prayers and people we should pray for. So so know know this. There's a biblical basis for having a list of a multitude of things you pray for. And then there's a biblical basis for when you go into that prayer time to make an outline from that list. Use a prayer outline. Create a prayer list. And then lastly, I would say this. Pray Scripture. Pray scripture. You see a, a, another example from the life of Daniel. Uh, there is an occasion in which he was asked to interpret uh, the king's dream. And when the Lord gave him the meaning of the dream in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, uh, Daniel praised God and declared, may the name of God be praised forever and ever for wisdom and power belong to him. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I offer thanks and praise to you, God of my fathers, because you have given me wisdom and power. And now you have let me know what we have asked of you. You have let us know the king's mystery. Why did I just read that to you? Well, years ago in studying that passage, I learned that the first part of that passage contains snippets of Scripture. In other words, Daniel's words didn't come from himself. Daniel was praying many of the things written in the law and the prophets in the Psalms. Daniel was praying Scripture. So we see this great uh, biblical key to praying powerful prayers. Read the Bible regularly. Be a student of scripture. Don't be a person driven by your emotions and feelings. Be a person driven by the truth of God. Let your heart and mind be like a storehouse of God's words. Have words and phrases memorized. Read the Bible so much that you can easily have scripture roll off of your lips Have a mind that is pre-programmed by the Word of God. And then go into your prayer time and pray biblical prayers. You have a, a guarantee from Scripture when you pray biblical prayers, God will hear and answer because biblical prayers are prayers that are in alignment with His will. So pray biblical prayers. Be a student of the Bible. You'll know what to pray. You'll know how to pray. Pray Scripture. I'd also say this. Take many of the great prayers that are in the Bible and pray them to the Lord. Sometimes you may not know what to pray. Go to Matthew 5, 3 through 10 and pray over the Beatitudes and ask God to make those things a reality in your life. Sometimes you may need to confess sin and you don't know what to say. You feel so broken. Go and take Psalm 51 before the Lord and get on your face before him and recite it to him from your heart. You say, Patrick, isn't that kind of liturgical or formal or kind of insincere? Well, it could be if you're just reading it to read it, but it doesn't have to be. If you read it sincerely from the heart and have a focus on the Lord, you can be like Daniel. It can be an act of real worship. Other passages you could pray would be maybe Philippians 1, 9 through 11, Paul's prayer for the 
church at Philippi and their virtues. Second Peter 1, 3 through 8, Peter lists virtues that should be present in our life. Galatians 5, 19 through 26, there Paul speaks of the fruits of the Spirit. I often pray that the Lord would produce those in my life. You could pray Psalm 131, Psalm 25, or pray Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. Praying Scripture will help you have a gospel-centered, God-centered, Word of God, faithful prayer life. So remember, if you want to be strong in prayer, know what prayer is, find a place, find a time, create an agenda. May the Lord bless you and your prayer life for His glory. Thank you for joining us today for our lesson on basic Christian life. Stay current with other episodes by subscribing to our podcast or visit us online at basicdiscipleship.net. If you have any questions about the materials presented in this lesson, or if you would like to give feedback, email us at info at basicdiscipleship.net. Thanks for listening.